thing yet again in this awesome space. And for that, he gets a free, he's hiring first to tell you about what he's hiring for. Uh, yeah, we're always hiring. Um, we're mostly starting from just good people, but we're definitely focused on DevOps and the security realm. And um, also, we are working on the DevOps. Um, if you are in the DevOps, you know, the kind of things we're looking for is someone who's familiar with basically all new modern technologies and would not be afraid to do something like delete your production account and prove that you can rebuild it, and delete your dev and test accounts on a regular basis and, and show that that's not an issue. Um, so, you know, that kind of thing, it's like you just can do a good place to work. Cool. And then uh, for the pizza drinks, uh, Jerry from Tech Town. And I uh, just want to remind everyone to let you guys know that uh, DevOps Baseball League is coming around the corner. It's September 7th and 8th this year. And we'd love for all of you guys to join if you're interested. Um, if you didn't pick up a card with the pizza, you can get a $5 discount off your ticket. Uh, you can get up five as a uh, discount code. So if you're interested in that, uh, please use that. And uh, we're also looking for volunteers still. So uh, if you're interested in helping out the <coughs> speakers or trying to help out with the uh, ticket booth, there is a free ticket involved in that. And also there that you get a sweet limited edition pink t-shirt with the logo on it. <laughs> so yeah, if you're interested in this guy's interested. But if you're interested in a pink t-shirt, yeah, uh, meet me after the meetup and I can give you some information on it. All right, excellent. And then finally, for the uh, excellent, um, uh, what dessert is that? Whatever that dessert oh, wow. is. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. by Hayes. The stuff you want to. Yes. Quick? Well, hi, I'm Kimberly with uh, Hayes, formerly referred to as Veritas, we're a global IT recruitment firm. Welcome, enjoy the baklava and the sweet. Uh, <laughs> first time we're still have up group. Anyone? Cool. Just one. All right, stand up, talk about yourself for five minutes. Everyone. <laughs> uh, cool. Uh, who's hiring? You don't get to go again. Anyone hiring? Anyone low? Well, I mean, it's like, like a weird matchmaker. Right? Yeah. So, anyone looking? Okay, everyone follow Matt. He's going to do interviews in the back while we do this. Uh, yeah, so uh, still website, trydevops.com. I uh, always beg for a new logo. I'm just going to live with it. Whatever. It works fine. So no new logo, but you can go there, find the Instagram account, Twitter, this meetup. Uh, one thing to announce, possibly, this is something that uh, I'm working on, is um, we I might be launching a Patreon for getting John Allspot down here to speak. If you know anything about John Allspot, he's like one of the gurus of DevOps. He's written a bunch of books, including he uh, assisted on the DevOps Handbook, Phoenix Project, uh, Art of Capacity Planning. It's a book he wrote all on his own. Uh, brilliant guy, works at Etsy, pushed the blameless culture, just a lot of DevOps stuff. Uh, so keep an eye out. I'll be announcing that through the meetup. Uh, we might get them for free. We might have to pay them. I don't know yet. So we'll play it by ear. Um, just post that photo to yourself, and I'll just slowly convince them with those. Um, but yeah, so that's probably coming up. The next uh, meetup will be, um, it's open to everyone. I haven't posted it yet, but it's a DevOps transformation with SaaS and Dynatrace that they're hosting. It's open to everyone, but they're going to talk about their DevOps journey. So that'll be next month, and I'll be posting that as soon as I get more details on it. Uh, anything else? Anyone else have any announcements? Anything? All right. Uh, uh, that's close. All right, so without further ado, uh, just to give you a little heads up on the speaker, um, he's uh, wonderful. Um, he's uh, very knowledgeable. Um, I manage him. So uh, if he doesn't do a great job on this, then he'll be looking. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I'm going to hand it over to Brian and get started. Good evening. Let's keep up my screen share. Go. There. Share the whole screen. Cool. So, uh, I'm Brian Cottingham. I'm a DevOps engineer at Align Technology. Uh, a lot of my job revolves around automating Amazon infrastructure. 
uh, especially around our developer support accounts. And we've been looking for ways to integrate uh, innovative technologies like chat ops and chat bots to help us get a better insight into what our infrastructure is doing at any given moment and to help us control our infrastructure in a public way, in a way where uh, public to the, to the other team members, uh, in a way where we can all see what's happening, where we can learn how to manage the infrastructure by watching it being done rather than looking at some documentation that might or might not be up to date. Uh, and we're looking at ways to, to start getting a lot more visibility into stuff that's usually hidden behind some dashboard or some portal or just not monitored at all. Uh, there's, there's often questions about what's actually running uh, in any given uh, in, uh, dev environment and the chatbot is a way to answer that. There's, a, there's questions about what's the state of support tickets that the developers have for us and the chatbot can be used to help us see when developers are responding, help us see if any of us have actually responded to the developers and provide us with a way to discuss issues and solutions amongst ourselves in the Slack channel and have that more or less go into the JIRA ticket automatically so that we don't have to do double duty for documentation and data capturing. So I'm going to show you the basics of how to do your first chatbot tonight, just to get you comfortable with doing the, the, the general coding to get you some inspiration for what it can do for you. Uh, it's not a workshop, so I can't offer a lot of handholding for if, if you're trying to code along and you run into problems, but you're welcome to, to, to install and to follow along if you're able. I'll periodically <laughs> come in and push what I have so that you can see what what's going on. Um, I'm going to be doing this with Hubot and I'll be programming with node 8 and npm 5.3. If you're doing Hubot in general, you can use lower versions, but those provide some features that I like for simplifying what I'm showing to you. <coughs> yes. Uh, what is Hubot? Uh, written in by default? Hubot by default is written in the CoffeeScript programming language, which is a, a language that compiles to JavaScript. It's geared towards uh, Ruby people who were interacting with JavaScript and have become accustomed to Ruby, um, to Ruby language features and language syntax. Uh, I'll be using pure JavaScript to interact with Hubot tonight as I feel it's more, it's what more people are going to be familiar with and comfortable with. So the, the, key, the key things that you really are looking for in your chatbot are insight into what's happening and, the, and ways to, to, to do things together as a team instead of having people just do it kind of in little silos on their command line where nobody's really sure what's happening and to, to learn by seeing it happen. So I've got all this without actually going through my slides. So there's a thousand ways that we can approach this problem programmatically. There's a lot of different data sources that you could be pulling from, a lot of different command layers that you could be pushing to. There's a lot of technologies that you could be writing the bot in. And I'm just going to pick something that works as an example and leave it as an exercise to you to plug in the specific pieces for what your infrastructure does. Cool, so, code, code, code. So, slide this over. There. So, I'm gonna start by setting up my Hubot project in my repository here. I'm going to initialize the JavaScript project. Yeah. Is that good? Cool. 
And I'm going to give it defaults for a bunch of these values because they're not important for the moment. And there we go. So that provides my basic uh, description file for my JavaScript uh, project. So now I'm going to follow the steps here to install the Hubot project generator, which is going to pull in all the specific Hubot dependencies and give me a directory layout with a lot of the common organization inside of it. And it pulls in a variety of common features. So if you try to install just ordinary Hubot, then it might not have the same uh, persistence layer built out of the box. Uh, it might not have several other features that we're gonna just kind of assume that we want as part of a standard bot. So I've installed the package that will generate the project, and I need to actually generate the project. It's gonna ask me some questions to set up, you know, how does the bot identify itself in my Slack channel, for example. I tell it that I'm gonna use a Slack bot. I don't want it to go and change all of the stuff I did in my regular package JSON. It will add the, the dependency that it needs. Cool. So now I've got a whole bunch of stuff here, including this uh, Hubot scripts uh, file that is a legacy file for old style Hubot stuff. If you leave it there, you get a deprecation warning, so I'm just gonna remove it. So now let's just run it and see what we get. So I run the bot and I say, you know, you can understand yourself with the exclamation mark prefix if you're in a chat room. So that's, if, you're, if you've seen chat bots before, you know that they often have like a back tick or an exclamation mark or something to know when you're talking to the bot. So out of the box, it gives me this, um, this command line interface so that I can try it out without having it hooked up to Slack yet. Tell the bot help, it prints out all of its help text. Ping pong, so we see that it works. Hooray! So now we're gonna go and actually authorize our bot to hop into Slack. So we go here and uh, apps and integrations. Make this a little bigger. Manage custom integrations. Bots. Add a bot. Let's give it a name. Very fun name. Very predictable name. Very creative name, full of inspiration. And now we've got the auth token that our bot's gonna use to talk to Slack. Don't share it with 40 other people. Ah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Actually, pull it off to the side again. There. So now, we can go and tell the bot to use Slack. Uh, off to, I have that in reading specific things. Of course I didn't. So we bought Slack token, cool. You bought Slack token. So it's gonna start up again, and this time, instead of being in the command line, it's gonna pop up in my channel. Well, it's gonna pop up in Slack that I can invite it to the channel. Cool. 
Ta-da, we have a bot in the channel. And that's what it takes to get the out of the box functionality working. So now we're gonna go and tell it to actually do some new fun custom stuff. It's gonna be fun. So uh, I've got a sample environment set up where I've got Google Container Engine running with a couple of simple applications and I've got a couple of Docker images available so I can promote them and demote them. And we're just gonna do a couple of simple bot commands to, to query Container Engine for what's running and how much of it's running, how many, how many containers are running in each instance and to toggle those features. Uh, I'm going to be doing this by wrapping the kubectl command line tool because that's the simplest path for, for this demo and you're probably going to want to wrap some command line tools anyway, so it's a good stand-in for what you might do for your first part of your bot. Yes? Did you tell your bot to talk on a particular channel or can it talk on all channels when you start out with Slack? When, when you auth your bot with Slack, it that does not join any channel by default. It joins the entire server, and then people in the server can invite the bot to specific channels, and then it will listen to every channel that it's in. So. So I'm going to first install a Node.js module that I want to use to interact with the command line Kubernetes client. While you're typing, can you do that from the Slack bot or not? Okay. Would, you, would you make updates to the bot itself environment from the, from the Slack channel? So it's possible to code the bot to be self-updating in capacity. Uh, I'm not aware of any out-of-the-box functionality for it. But if, you're, if you've automated the deployment of your bot onto some uh, compute instance somewhere, then you can tell the bot to deploy a new version of its own automation. And it'll just, like a, like a compiler, that compiles the own language it's written in, it'll tear itself down and spin up a new version and it's fun recursive magic. So I've got the library that I'm going to use for generating child processes from JavaScript. And so I'm going to go and make a library folder to put this in. You can, you can, um, there, so there's two pieces to writing the, um, to, to how you often want to structure your Slack bot. You've got the, the piece that Hubot itself has. Uh, uh, here, here's the example that they come out of the box with written in CoffeeScript. Uh, you've got the, uh, the pieces here which tell it what sort of uh, text patterns to listen to, to respond to. So you, we saw in the chat room, if I told it ping, it came back with pong. And this is the sort of way that you're gonna tell it that, is if, if, I, if I send it a message that says badgers, then it gives me this UHF reference. Um, so that's the Hubot piece but you don't want to put all of your application logic inside those handlers because then it's, it's kind of all mixed together, the logic with your IO and user interaction, and it's, in, uh, uh, it's organized in a way that's more difficult to test in isolation. So I know that if I have a bot that changes my infrastructure, I want to make sure that I actually unit test or integration test that to make sure it changes the right thing in the right way, and if your code for that is wrapped up inside the code that expects to be talked to in a chat context, that's going to be difficult to do. So I'm going to begin my module for talking to Kubernetes. So I've got an example here. Uh, doo -doo -doo. The first thing I want to do is be able to actually just list the stuff that I've got running, which should, uh, should be this one. There we go. 
So if I see on the command line what I'm expecting to get, and if I update my path accordingly, I actually have the Kubernetes tool in there. It's going to go off and run it, and this is the sort of format that I get. I said I've got an instance named try DevOps demo, like we see here. It's got a single container running. It is it. It's got a single container running. It wants to have one running, so it's good to go. It's very happy with itself. We're happy with it. Yes. Woo. So let's go ahead and start with this, uh, with, with just a simple proof that we can run our module and, and so that we can start our iterative development loop. So module exports dot list services. This one is uh, get deployment is with service name cool actually type things correctly. So I ex so I declared my function, but I didn't actually call it yet. So. Coding live, it worked in the dry run. Search name console log. of people and your brain just turns to mush. See, by the end of the night I'll be out 200. Yep. <laughs> there. If I actually write out the file, things are more likely to work. So there. So we've got this simple hello world. Uh, we're going to import this as a library, and we don't want our little test code to run every time we import it. We only want it to run if we actually call it from the command line. So I'm going to wrap it in this simple check that will only call it. this operation is finished. So we should get the output of ls, and look, we do. Excellent. So let's grab our command line that we want to use. And instead of doing ls, let's use a template string so we can do some variable substitution. And we'll say 
kubectl get deployment service name. And it's going to come back and tell us that the bogus service name isn't defined. That makes sense. We're going to handle that at error handling at a higher level in our chat box. We're going to tell it later when we actually write the chat interface uh, to tell the user that they need to provide an actual valid one. So for now, let's correct that to an actually existing deployment. And there we go. We are actually. Um, we, we've got the output captured here in the result standard out. But that's not the format that's necessarily useful in the bot. We, we want, we don't, the bot doesn't want to have this header in there when we're in Slack, and we're probably going to want to capture these specific values to be able to parse them later. So you can you present in a useful way what fraction of your desired container count is actually up. So let's go ahead and update to do that. Service details. So let's split on new lines. So we have each line separate. Get all lines following the first, which is probably just one. So we can say get the first one. We actually, can just do here. We got just that first line. So now let's split it into the separate parts. We split on a regular expression for any number of white spaces, and now we've got an array containing each of the separate items. So if we come back up to where we have our header visible, then we can start extracting this into separate components. Service details, that would be the second item. Third, third item. Fourth, the fourth item, fourth from zero. Cool. Now, well, we can put this into a handy dandy object. Uh, you are correct. Thank you. So now we should have an object that contains all of our values. If I actually write the file from BIM. Yada. Put the service name back in there just so the object is self contained. Cool. So that is our first file. So now let's go and actually write a Slack interaction for that data. Let's make a main JS file in Hubot's scripts directory. Anything in the scripts directory, Hubot is going to load up, look for a function that's exported as that module's sole export, and it's going to pass that function its, own, its robot object that, that we are going to use to build up our set of commands and our set of hand, uh, responses. Robot. Robot dot spawned. And it takes a regular expression first. Get details for 
get a capture group. And we'll just assume anything after that is a valid name for a service. We, we define an anonymous function that's going to handle when this happens. Uh, res is the standard name in Hubot parlance for the object that contains the details of the capture group and the methods that it takes to respond to the channel that the user messaged in and to the user who sent the message. So let's say uh, res.send hello. Woo. Let's go back and actually run our Hubot command. Cool, so we say, we give it our command, and we get hello back. Hello is of course not useful, so let's actually call the code that we just wrote. So, const kas equals require kas. There's our library that we wrote. So we're gonna say this is an async function, because if you call an async function, you need to be an async function too. Const this name equals match one. So the match contains the match details in the regular expression. Match item zero is the entire matched line. Item one is the first capture group. Equals ks dot get service details service. So the capture group is what's inside the regular the, inside the uh, the parentheses in the regular expression. So the regular expression says this is a pattern of text that I want to match. If a line follows this pattern, trigger this set of code, and. This, the syntax here says, for dot star says match anything, and the parentheses say go ahead and take everything that matches this pattern, in this case anything to the end of the line, and put it into a variable where I can get access to it. Uh, if we can do fancier patterns for other commands where we have, say, multiple capture groups in a line, so I can say uh, upgrade application in environment to version and capture all three of those separately. So the Hubots API is this res.match, which is an array, and then the number is the index into the array, starting from one for the individual capture groups. So we're going to go and tell it to actually grab the details and then send them. It's going to just stringify this object like JSON. And then we should be able to get an explosion. Yeah. Stack trace isn't even in my code. Okay, so we're going to go and do a quick why is this happening? Let's see if we can just print this out and get the answer. I bet you it's happening because it wants this to be a string. Okay. 
there we go. All right, you bought something running again. And yeah, I uh, I expected it to stringify the object for me by just calling to string, and it decided it couldn't. So now um, it is actually running this code and not grabbing my server name. It's got the try DevOps demo as the value of service name and it's not calling it because live coding is fun. So back at my library, deployment, service name, we saw that that worked. So, deployment, ah. I forgot to actually await the result of that. And so Node.js decided to take a promise and decided to give me the string result of that promise instead of waiting for it to come back. And I didn't restart the bot. The best time. Yeah, the best of times at all. Restart. Sorry. Uh, this one has to be async because it is the one that's actually closest to the asynchronous call. Now if I restart, I'm going to actually get something that's going to be fun and I'll look like I'm great at this. It's like real life. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Cool. It didn't crash with the syntax error and get details, try that looks to console service name, get deployment service name, details, details, details. Oh, because I coded this wrong. Service scale and not service details. <laughs> you got what you asked for. Yeah, yeah. You got what you wanted. <laughs> like most requirements. Ah, look, it actually works. It's great. Uh, and right there. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> So um, uh, ordinarily, I would go and show you formatting that to be something that's pretty and readable. But uh, in the interest of keeping on the schedule, I'll leave string formatting as an exercise to you and move on to actually having the bot change something. So without showing it, is that where you use a Slack message attachment? Would you format it as an attachment, or would you just send the JSON? So right now, I'm just sending the JSON as text in the message. Uh, if I wanted to format this a little better, uh, what I'd really do is try to make it human readable. And so I would just do string interpolation to, you know, like string concatenation to, to, to say service name is at scale one slash two slash three. Uh, uh, this this should support sending the pre-formatted messages if you want to send uh, the code blocks to Slack to have it look like that. So let's go. So, one question: Would there be a security concern with having this out on on Slack? I've, I've heard 
personally never used it, um, but it's just something you would use in, in, uh, in practice. So it depends a bit on how you choose to architect it. At my company, for example, all Slack users are valid Active Directory users, and it's t and your Slack name is tied to your Active Directory name. So if you're talking to the bot at all, we can trust that you're at least a person in the company with permission to be in this channel. And in a lot of cases, that might be good enough. There are also Hubot plugins that will give you more advanced permissions layers where you can maintain a list of specific users that are allowed to run specific commands. And then you can lock it down as much or as little as you'd like. So all the commands are running with the Hubot? Yes, user. whatever the user Hubot's running as is the authority that your commands have. If, if it's by the Hubot multiple channels, can Hubot send along with who's chatting what, what channel they're chatting on? Yes. So, so let's go ahead and write the, the command, the, the function that's going to actually change some infrastructure. So in my, uh, in my command list for Kubernetes commands, that's the command that I'd run to actually toggle the in the image that's running. So it went from 191 to 192. I can change it back. And it'll catch up and change back. So we're going to have a simple function that changes that. Uh, and we need three parameters to make this work. We've got the name of the cloud engine, or container engine deployment. That container engine can contain multiple containers in a single unit, so you have to tell it which one you're gonna push the image to. And then you have the actual name of the image, which Google expects as a full URL to an image in a registry. Following up on the security question, are, is your company at all concerned that Slack admin has access to drive your bot around because a nefarious insider outside your company could actually drive your bot around? In our particular company, the people with Slack admin have some degree of privilege to many of the services anyway. Um, and and at this point, we uh, we haven't um, we're not so worried about a malicious insider. Uh, as the platform matures and as we uh, wrap up handling core features, then we can turn our attention back towards the, the security vectors that are possible but not front and center on our on our threat list. Your products may vary. Yes. <laughs> So let's just do I paste in the whole command. slash service name container equals image cool so we've got this new function in our library deploy app that just calls the shell command with the parameters that we send it your parameters version instead of the image you are right Thank you. So let's create a new uh, message handler in Hubot. Deploy application app.
So we've got three capture groups, just one for the one for each of those three parameters. So we're going to say const um, service name container image equals match one match two match three. Thank you. So KS dot deploy app. Okay, we'll go wait that and then say res dot send deployed. Here, but then we're going to run this and get our handy dandy command. Move this over here. Wow. Because I did, I do it. Didn't declare that as an async function. Cool. Start it up. So let's grab some parameters, copy the long one. say this is we want the deploy app command Conta uh, deployment name app container name and our image we set it to one last time so let's set it to two now No soup for you. Deploy app demo demo. Wasn't it GCI dot IO? It was, but it should at least still be telling me it's attempting to deploy right now. More silly mistakes because live code. Match is not a global value, it's actually on the object. Deploying, deployed. Look at that, it does things. It's amazing. Do, 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 do. Load my images, load my image. Yeah. I added the G, I copied the wrong one. That is absolutely correct. <laughs> so, 
go, Google Cloud. I believe in you. <laughs> so I can see that it's at least trying to update because it says nothing is running. And I've seen that before when I gave it an invalid image name. I tried to run the image and it didn't work. So that thing. Cluster works. Once in a while, it just decides to be slow actually loading my item. And somewhere in here is a way to actually see what I gave it. You know, like, uh, I've got a command that does this. This command, instead of waiting for the web interface, will actually tell me there. Yeah, it's actually running the version I told it. It's just slow to actually spin up my new container. Cool. So that's the thing. So we've listed some services and we've gotten the scale of a specific service. So we, we've been interacting with the command line. Uh, we can just fetch ordinary data through the API, if we, through, a, through any web API if we want to. So uh, if my application has something that it exposes, like uh, for example, at a line we have applications that expose some health check data via an HTTP endpoint that each microservice hosts. So we can pull the application and say, are you actually healthy? Can you talk to the right uh, S3 buckets? Are you able to reach the global internet when you need to? Uh, do you actually have the correct database access? And we can have the bot pull that information via the HTTP API. Uh, so as um, e the, the general structure of tying that into the bot is more or less the same. Um, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to save actually uh, walking through creating the code to do that and show you what I prepared in advance. So the gist of it is that we, it, we use this node library that makes HTTP access easy. We can query this same version.txt that Google should be turning on. Uh, query version.txt, grab the text out of it. And we have a, a general structure the same as before. We can have a command, get service version with the name of the service that we want, parse it, parse out the match group from the regular expression. Uh, in my pre-prepared example, uh, I actually validated the name against a list of services. So I listed the services and made sure that the service you asked for actually existed, and then called that services endpoint and returned the value. So, in this example here, we've got a command that's kind of verbose, and we might like to change that to be um, a little bit less verbose. So we want we might want to have we might want to say you know de just deploy app and have the bot ask us you know give me some details tell me what's the application what's the image. And maybe I could even supply partial information and the bot can come back and ask me for what it's missing. So the general structure for this kind of really trivial workflow is uh, I programmed in a sequence of, of questions to ask. I, I just assumed for the sake of the demo that we're not providing partial data that I just wanna ask in order. So when I said deploy service, uh, I start this switchboard from another Hubot module. It, it takes the, it, it observes the user who just sent the message and starts a conversation with them and keeps a little bit of state so that as the user sends the message, sends their next messages in response to your questions, it knows where it is. You know, you'll notice in the previous commands, I could say list services, and then deploy a service and 
the bot just treated those independently as separate commands. Uh, trying to organize the conversation that way would be challenging because you you want quest answers like yes and the bot has no idea what to do with yes unless it understands that it just asked you a question and that's what this module does we start off with a command and deploy service and then we ask the, the bot asks the user a question what's the name of the service and then it adds another regular expression that captures that and then keeps going down what's the container name what's the image name and then it puts all those together tells you it's going to deploy performs the deploy tells you that it finished and depending on what your command sy uh, syntax is going to look like there are other ways to structure this to be um, uh, to be a little bit more straightforward or a little simpler for the user or for the bot author. So instead of a sequence of commands, you can have the user supply in succession just keys and values that are very easy for the bot to parse and, and not have all of these separate uh, command types in here. Is that multi-threaded, multi-processing, and is there interlock so that Try to do something in the back end of the bot after having conversations with multiple users and then you get a cohesive uh, request. So that comes down to uh, Node.js behavior rather than Hubot specific behavior. Uh, in the case of <laughs> Node.js, the concurrence, concurrency story is. Um, it's a little bit complicated to explain, but the short of it is the bot is perfectly happy to keep listening to more messages on on any channels you're in while it's doing this, and it'll do your background work. So one user can start one of these command sequences, and while they're busy typing their answers, another user can have other interactions going, and then when the bot goes off to run these commands to actually do the deployment, it can do that while users are still interacting. And so it's, it's all concurrent and the bot never just locks up while it waits for something to happen. How's that work in Slack channel? You'll see the messages interwoven, but each human should understand the context that they're, they're working in. Um, the, 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 the bot will happily parse whatever order they wind up arriving in and so it's up to the human to say uh, I know that I'm typing yes to the question the bot answered or asked me. So the context of that conversation subsystem talk to a particular human on the Slack channel when it's getting answers or because now you confuse me if people can answer at any point <laughs> Yeah. No, it's aware of which human is okay. interacting with it. And it uh, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's hmm? you could choose to make it create a thread, but by default it just uses ordinary messages in the channel. Yep. Is it scalable? In in what regard? Number of users conversing with the bot at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Any machine that you host this on will have no problem with that. Chat messages are are very lightweight to process, and it doesn't keep much data in memory for each user and each channel it's interacting with. Right. Sure. Sure. Is any discretion, like you know, at user? Yes. Yeah, it knows it, so it can pass it back. You know, it can pass it back to you and say, "Hey, so and so, you asked me this question or whatever. Um, this is my question back to you." Yeah. Okay, so the twenty messages just happened while you're talking. So I remember what you were doing. <laughs> well, I mean, the thing to keep in mind is when you're doing this is that you know you might want to limit you know the channels that this thing, the, the things that it does, and this conversations that it has, limit the channels that it's in, so that you don't have all your chatter going on in those channels at the same time you're trying to do your work in the channels. Yeah. And nothing, it doesn't, you're right. There's nothing to prevent you from doing that, but it might make it a little bit easier for everyone to get along with the bot if you if you do those sorts of things. So a couple of things. This is our actual uh, chatbot at uh, at a line, our dynamic reliability show we named it. It might look a little familiar if you take a look at it to someone that's the same 
I'm sorry, I'm running here. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we can show you kind of how we use it. So do you guys pretty much use this channel and you have your variable, okay, you change something. Uh, um, just go back to the channel and see what you might not take it away. You uh, just put in uh, notifications mm -hmm. where it is not working. Yeah, I think it's probably trying, probably trying to talk to one of the services that's having trouble. Oh, okay. Or I should show that it's down. You know, if you talk to his name in a private message, you can also. And if you add it, yeah. Page. Yeah, so as an aside to this, we we built a, a dashboard, a health check dashboard for APIs, and this thing actually interfaces with it so that we can get quick data. So uh, Brian could, uh, no, you don't have VPN, but um, this is all gathering data from the health check dashboard we did. It's just a different way of presenting it. So this is like on the road, I need to check whatever, I can't get to my laptop, I just want to check for my phone. So it's a really easy way of, like, for instance, we're showing all our manifests in one of our developer environments, our H2 environment, and we can sit there and quickly just look down through the lists um, and compare versions. The big thing with the a uh, lot of conversations is typically you're not going to have 20 people interfacing on the same channel at once. They're getting it's a conversation. The way that you want to treat these is that it is another person in the chat and that the conversation there, you wouldn't just like 20 people don't chat to one person all at once, you know, it's like all the conversation. So, um, and then here again, you can see the health of an environment, which is really nice. So one of the things with our dashboard is that it sits off to the side on a television. And, you know, if we don't, if you see red come up, you can then just pop in here to the chat without even getting up. And if you can tell which environment it is, pop in here, check the environment. Oh, now H2 WebCC is in error state. And then you can also drill in and show details for H2 WebCC. Can you, uh, is there a built down slide or something to say? Just show me all the things involved in that. Something. You, see you can write history that. History is. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, check up four. <laughs> But in case, I would certainly want to manage the number of people in the channel. What if you were managing a couple hundred instances or something? Uh, you break it out. So for us, this is uh, we break it up by environment. So how many nodes do we have total? Uh, you can hit the fab stuff on this, right? Uh, no. Uh, no. No. Okay. No. Uh, yeah. So it's something that we've worked through as well because we have some environments that have 240 nodes. How many? What's our big one? Like 220 uh, ish. Um, yeah, 220. So 220 nodes that we have to display data for. So we split it up by environment. So you can see, like, he defines it show health in H2. Um, and it's all about just figuring out the best method of that. And if you're at the level where you do have 220 lines scrolling past it, this isn't probably the right solution for doing that kind of data. Um, but at a high level, so he talked a lot about this at a high level. For instance, something with 220 nodes, if one of them is bad, let's just show it a high level of that environment as red. So then you can go to the dashboard and build it and see. So. But we did this over, uh, it's maybe like total, what, eight hours of work, if that. Yeah, thereabouts, maybe. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's possible, and this is hugely beneficial for us, and to be able to check our versions, to be able to check the health of any of our APIs. And it was literally eight hours of work that we did. Um, not as part of our normal like day-to-day uh, -day work, just so. So, uh, all the messages from a single user are they processed sequentially? Yes. So, say in a scenario, if the user says deploy this app for me, and then two three messages down, the user says, "Oh no, wait, don't deploy." Then what happened in that? Case? So, uh, in that case, you better hope the bot didn't start yet. <laughs> uh, it, the, the, the bot doesn't uh, out of the box understand uh, uh, checks and balances and confirmations. You have to program that in. So, um, so uh, it, what we did in, in, uh, our, in our bot is we said, you know, deploy this application. 
are you sure you want to deploy, yes or no? And if you felt extra paranoid, you could add a delay in and say, okay, it'll, the bot will say, I'm going to deploy in five minutes. And then you can have a command that the, that the user can enter to abort that. But out of the box, it's just code that's going to run as fast as the machine will do it. So what if two different users with same kind of access gives contradictory command? Some sort of... That, <laughs> first in, first that, out? Yep. Okay. Yep. And that's on the people side of things. Like, yeah. pay attention to the chat and don't launch to... No, I mean, on different channels and different environments working individually. Uh, yeah, Not so, intentionally, though. Uh, it's something we talked about, uh, which is just doing a lock file. Like, you could have the bot lock itself and then not know that it can't deploy again. Is GitHub publishing best practices or something? Because they got they don't on it. Uh, they've done a, there's a, I think it's an hour and a half talk of how they do it. Um, they're much more conversational with them. And I will say the one thing that we really have learned uh, with this is that you learn how to communicate with people through this. So for instance, the simple yes and no, well, people could type that as a Y, a capital Y, a lowercase Y, yeah, yes, yeah, whatever. So, you know, munging that data and making sure that it, it matches so that someone can talk to it somewhat personal and, you know, like uh, say yeah or uh -huh, or whatever, and you, it parses all that down and, and still deploys. So if you want to get crazy and do like NLP of the model of Stacy or something, maybe a little outside of those things. GitHub does everything on theirs, I think. They can like completely do, I think, everything they want to do from their chatbot. It's, it's incredible. I mean, it's extend. Um, I mean, we did deployment tests with this, so we were able to deploy from chatbot. Um, and I mean, saw it with him deploying a, a Kubernetes. Uh, the, the biggest thing is you're going to, it needs the investment to treat it like a first class citizen. Yeah, and, and the more complicated you try to make the interaction model, the more investment it takes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the way that I like to think about the design is um, is for the, the quickest bang for the buck, then treat it like you de design a command line application with a very you know, terse and structured syntax. Get your initial value out of it for just getting information, controlling your environment and then come back around later and make it a little more flexible and a little more friendly when you've got the time for that investment. Mm -hmm. so if you guys force everybody into uh, the chat as opposed to doing things from their own chill. Not, not presently, and I'm not sure that that's necessarily a good idea. There are a lot of advantages to having everybody do their work from the chat bot. As I highlighted, it gives you insight, and it makes it much easier for people who are new to a particular, uh, particular workflow to see how it's done and to do it themselves. But you want to make sure that you get people to, to, to buy into the whole general idea and the whole workflow. And it's not going to be the comfortable workflow for everybody. Some people are going to want to use the command line tools that they've been using for years. Some people are going to like using the web interface because it's easy and friendly for them. And in cases like that, then you can kind of reach a middle ground by updating your legacy tools to notify into the channel when something happens. Yeah. You go to the command line, you deploy an application, and then your bot tells people that it happened so that you at least can still get that insight. They have a superior spectrum on using this. A lot of teams I see use based in this their superior layer. I'm actually wondering what you think of. I'm looking for a natural place to put a multi party authentication. So, meaning I need two out of four people to both say yes to go a certain action. And this seems like a natural place to implement something like that, assuming I lock down all of the actors. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You can just drop into your channel and says, someone wants to do X, just tell me yes or no, and just counts them up and says, I'm doing it. Yeah, because it's, yeah, you do something in the chat room where people are already sitting and interacting with each other, interacting with infrastructure, and then you don't have to send people to this other place to do special action. You can you can use this as a unified interface for a lot of things. So I, I know you, this is 
real interesting for you guys just exploring it. Sort of as these things grow, they kind of become critical infrastructure components, right? Mm -hmm. So, what's sort of the model for dealing with the whole software pipeline, the whole build of like that? It's going to be a unique per place. So, I've implemented a chatbot in a previous job that could do deployments that are going through the deployments of their new block, new authentication, all that kind of stuff, but this is completely different. So, this one's written completely different from that one. One of the biggest struggles I will say that we ran into is not technically or code level. It's so a good example is uh, talking to Amazon Alexa, right? There's so many times where I won't, um, I, I can't imagine the kind of curse word she's recorded where I completely forget what I'm trying to say. Uh, and then you're just like, oh, I meant, you know, and then they stumble around in it. The thing that we really struggled with was trying to develop a common language so that you can keep it. So if you notice like in these commands and if he does a help on that, we started to develop this like syntax of, you know, everything is show to Drew Box. And then the second thing on that is the for and in. So for is always the applicator environment. Wait, is that right? Uh, for is the application level and in is the environment level. So to try to take care of some of that mental like burden of, wow, I can't remember all these commands because it, it's an anti-pattern to type one, have to type help again, hit it again. It started to push us towards conversational where you want to open up the, the thread of saying, I, I want to start a conversation with you. I'm going to ask some stuff, give me back the things I need. And then you become a little more human with it and a little more predictive of saying, I want to ask about this environment. Well, I see two, two uh, nodes that are down. Do you want details on those? Yes. And then it starts to feel like you're versus another person. Right now, you can see it's very much conversing with a machine. But um, that's the kind of level that if you treat as a first class citizen, you can get to where it feels like you're conversing with, you know, your, your infrastructure bot who goes out and gets the data that you want. You can kind of somewhat predict what you need to know. It's got a connector for campfire. It's got a connector for slide. It's got a bunch of connectors. Yeah, it's he Hubot is kind of one of the big options for doing this. So if it's possible to do a chatbot with Teams, Hubot probably does it. Any other questions? Right, I think that's it. Cool. All right, thanks, Brian. <laughs>